A volcanic outcrop in the Indian Ocean, some 200 kilometers from Mauritius, about two hours from the Seychelles. Hello and welcome to France, or more precisely, the French overseas territory of La Réunion, Reunion Island. We're here for one of our Talking Europe agricultural specials, when we follow the funds of the EU's largest budget, the Common Agricultural Policy. This island has a tropical climate in which exotic fruits and sugarcane can thrive, but with a mountainous terrain that's often hit by hurricanes, farming here isn't always easy. As one of the EU's outermost regions, it does get extra funds from Brussels to compensate for the constraints of being offshore. So what exactly are the EU's outermost regions and what do they get? Let's take a look. Have you ever heard of Europe's sun-drenched ORs? It's the obscure acronym for the EU's outermost regions. Most are scattered across the world's oceans, but not all fall under OR status. Bora Bora, for example, is not an OR, nor are the Falkland Islands, and Greenland isn't one either. In fact, OR territories are like a VIP club. In all, there are nine. Off the west coast of Africa, the Portuguese islands of Madeira and the Azores. To the south lie the Spanish Canary Islands. Crossing the Atlantic, there are the French territories of Guadeloupe, Martinique and Saint-Martin, and French Guiana. In the Indian Ocean, two more French islands, Reunion and the very last one to have joined the OR club, Mayotte. In these territories, EU rules do apply, but with lots of exceptions. Some are members of the Schengen Zone, while others aren't. Some ORs apply high VAT charges, others don't. Basically, it's the EU with each place cherry-picking EU rules. The ORs have a population of 1.5 million, less than 1% of the EU total. But that tiny fraction received 8 billion euros worth of subsidies between 2007 and 2013. That's four times more than the average European citizen. The goal of these EU subsidies is to develop the territories and to compensate for their difficulties. Geographical distance, challenging environment, lower average income, high imported food prices and the goal is to support local industry. Subsidies in return for products that everyone loves. Bananas, pineapples, sugarcane. The result? EU-made exotic products that turn out to be very expensive. Well, nothing really quite as sweet as this island's most common crop. In the 1800s, uh, farmers here began to put sugar in their coffee fields. Abandoning the bean, the sugar cane really took root and now accounts for 57% of agricultural land. To find out a bit more about its history, we've come to the Stella Matutina Museum. The Museum Stella Matutina the Stella Matutina Museum offers a history of Reunion by telling the story of sugarcane on the island. The growing and processing of sugarcane was not just about agriculture, technology or industry. Above all, it was a human venture, because to plant and process sugarcane, you need manual labor. And that came through slavery, indentured labor from Europe, Africa, Madagascar, India, the Far East. This diverse population created a unique Creole culture that allowed Reunion's population to bounce back each time it faced a crisis, whether it was economic or health-related. Until the end of the 17th century, agriculture on Reunion, known at the time as l'île Bourbon, was largely based on subsistence farming. And then larger-scale agriculture began with spices and coffee. That dominated the industry in the 18th century, but it ended at the start of the 19th century, when the coffee industry was hit by the Napoleonic Wars, by weather events and outbreaks of disease. It was no longer profitable, and it was replaced by sugarcane. It expanded quickly, and soon there were over 300 sugarcane factories on the island. Well, we've just seen there a little bit of the history then of sugarcane on the island. We're joined now by Philippe Jean-Pierre, an economist here in Reunion. Um, tell me, today, who owns the, the sugarcane fields of the Reunion Island? Is it small farmers? Is it big industry? Who, who gains the profit? It's not like uh, in countries like Brazil, Australia and Thailand, where there are one major fields. 
Rainion Islands, uh, uh, fields are very uh, divided between two groups. The majority, 80%, are for uh, small farmers, small fields, and the 20% like, are for uh, major owners, big farmers. Currently today, Reunion gets a lot of subsidies for its sugar cane. If we look at some figures, we can find that uh, uh, French government uh, helped the sugar cane industry around 84 uh, million of euro and a Europe, year. yeah, and European unions around 75. Okay, it's a huge amount of fundings which arrive in the uh, in this industry. But uh, uh, this industry uh, needs this fund because, uh, for example, and due to the small scale economy, small fields, and uh, the difficulty we have to produce on uh, uh, such a landscape with big mountains. Um, so the EU has decided to get rid of sugar quotas by September 2017. Now that means basically producers can make as much sugar as they like. What does that mean for sugarcane here in Reunion? We know that uh, uh, the 2017 year will be maybe a next step that we have to look for new future for the sector, the industry and the cane. Yeah, because one can say, uh, what is the point if we look at things economically, what's the point in, in continually growing a product that in the end it works out at a loss? It's like an investment. It helps employ some people who will be jobless without the sectors and uh, it helps to produce some other agricultural foods. Well, to find out a bit more about how farmers here and indeed sugar factories are feeling about the end of those sugar quotas, our reporter Johan Bonin went to meet them. The last cut of the season. Ludovic has almost finished harvesting this plot. His father set aside two hectares of land so he can learn the family trade. We have to harvest everything by hand. It's impossible to use machine here because the land is too steep. With the sun and everything, you have to be strong. If you want to be able to earn a bite to eat, as we say in Creole. <laughs> Three quarters of land used for growing sugarcane is unsuitable for mechanized farming. Little plots, eight hectares on average, it's hard for producers to make a living. Ludovic makes less than the minimum wage. There's no future for young people who want to start farming sugarcane. The land here is too expensive. But it's part of our culture. It's a tradition in reunion, and we must protect that, and above all, help us, the producers. In the last decade, 1,000 producers have given up. Those still farming are worried about the EU's decision to end sugar quotas. Jean-Yves Menacci has fought to protect the needs of small-scale producers for nearly 50 years. His final battle, maintaining the fixed purchase price of 40 euros per tonne, more than double the market price. For that, the French government has to subsidise the industry. France has asked the EU for authorization to subsidize 38 million euros as compensation for the end of sugar quotas. I don't know if it's temporary, but we're not going to ask every year for another 38 million euros. 28 million of the subsidy packet would go to Reunion, in addition to the 70 million euros allocated each year by Brussels. The island's industry is practically on life support. Two refineries are left, both of them belong to Toreas. In exchange for the subsidies, the firm says it will maintain fixed purchase prices for producers. 45% of Europe's sugar industry has shut down since 2006. Elsewhere in Europe, other possibilities exist. But in overseas territories, where unemployment is at 20 to 25%, where 60% under 25 are out of work, there just aren't a billion possibilities for people who lose their jobs. We've managed to make our value in society understood. That's why we benefit from subsidies. 180 million tonnes of sugar are produced around the world each year. Three quarters comes from developing countries where Toreas is present too. Production costs are much higher in Reunion. The island produces 200,000 tonnes a year. Grains that are the bread and butter of thousands on the island.
are now at the Botanic Gardens, which showcases the rich biodiversity that can be found on Reunion Island. As indeed, despite the dominance of the sugar cane, there's a variety of vegetation here. Uh, to tell us a bit more, we're joined by the mayor of a town on the eastern coast, saint Lieu, also MP for France, Mr. Thierry Robert. Thanks so much for your time. Tell me, first of all, how do you s explain, if you like, this obsession with the sugar cane on Reunion when really so much can thrive here? First of all, it's not an obsession. It's a reasonable concern. If they weren't concerned, that would mean people from Reunion would be irresponsible. Sugarcane is part of Reunion's history. Sure, today there is globalization, and that means we need to adapt in line with global production. But cane is not just the rum we drink, the sugar cubes we put in our coffee. Cane accounts for 10% of electricity production in Reunion. And cane is also methanol, because the EU finances research. Europe is not some kind of shop that gives money to make up for shortfalls. L'Europe peut aussi financer la recherche. So really uh, full of possibilities and beautiful, not just for the environment, but also good for the atmosphere. Um, at the same time, I was looking at the fruit and vegetable, the tropical fruit and vegetables grown on Reunion Island. I believe it, it gives 70% of the island's needs, but very little is exported. Is there not a market to grow more of this tropical fruit and veg and, and, and that side of agriculture? It's very simple. Perhaps we've focused too much on sugarcane. But today, there are 20,000 people directly or indirectly in the industry, and 35% of the union's population is unemployed, so we cannot afford to make mistakes when it comes to the cane industry. So you're right to say that here in the union, we could export, but I'll be biased now. The best fruits in the world are found here. Lychees and vanilla, for example, are just extraordinary. So that means Europe must accompany us as we transition and diversify. Well, I believe Reunion Island has hundreds of endemic plants, more insects, birds, even a mammal, uh, native to the island. Are the plants and are these elements um, protected? Many plants are protected species because biodiversity here in Reunion is extraordinary. It's not for nothing that this area is listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So lots more that can be exploited if the will is there. Um, looking back then at those sugar quotas that are set to end uh, by the September 2017, I believe a lot of politicians have asked Paris for more annual aid, state aid, to help the sugar cane. I believe it's now 128 million euros a year. For people on mainland France, if you like, who have the sugar beet, who, you know, why would they be interested in, in giving more state aid, state money to Reunion Island for another form of sugar? Sugar derived from beet has no taste. Sugarcane is something extraordinary and excellent. So, Robert, thanks so much for your time. Well, we heard a little earlier in the show from the sugar cane producers, but our reporter, Anais Guillard, went to find out what the sugar beet side of the story has to say about the end of those sugar quotas. Here's her report. 1,000 trucks carrying 23,000 tonnes of sugar beet every day. This is the biggest refinery of its kind in the world, and it's in Conant, a two-hour drive east from Paris. From September to January, the refinery produces 300,000 tonnes of white sugar. Its French owners see the end of the EU sugar export quota as an opportunity to tap new markets. At the moment, we see no risk of the sugar market becoming saturated. We know there is demand. The global market is growing by 1 to 2 percent a year, and it's been like that for the last 30 years. In September 2017, the EU will drop its 13.3 million tonne cap on sugar exports. Europeans will be able to produce, refine and export as much as they want. France's biggest firm, Tereus, is eyeing markets in Africa and Eastern Europe. It expects production to increase by a quarter. We'll still be working with 23,000 tons of sugar beets every day, but instead of 100 or 110 days, we'll start working over a 130-day period. If the refinery's machines are to keep turning for longer, 
more sugar beet is needed. Torreyes hopes farmers will increase production. But they've got used to a crop rotation cycle in line with the EU's quota system. I'd rather continue cultivating sugar beet every five years and not every three, because the soil will become overused and depleted, so will no longer be productive. The beet crop makes up 20% of this farmer's production. To push that up, he'll need to buy new land, an expensive risk he's not ready to take. Torreyes is guaranteeing a minimum price of 25 euros per tonne for the next two years, but he worries that after that, the price guarantees will be scrapped. It won't be easy because we've always relied on minimum purchase prices. We don't know if the same thing will happen to sugar beet as milk when we saw overproduction and world prices going down. When milk quotas were phased out, a drop in global prices hit dairy farmers hard. Beet growers fear the same scenario. To avoid it, many are following the EU's advice and opting for polyculture production, so they don't focus all their efforts on one crop. We're going to end with a final view of the coastline of Reunion Island, but join us again after the news as we head off to another of the EU's overseas territories. See you then.